All right, welcome everybody to Iran Brook Show. And, um, you know, I have to admit that uh, every week I, I say to myself, okay, this week we're not going to talk about Donald Trump. We are going to discuss some philosophical issue or something else or, or something more interesting. Um, and yet, <laughs> I have a feeling we're going to be talking about Trump a lot because every week he does something that seems to basically require uh, commentary. So uh, this week, in spite of not wanting to talk about immigration, whoops, this thing is, uh, uh, that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about immigration. Uh, we're going to talk, well, uh, we're going to talk about this ban on, on immigration or travel or visiting uh, from uh, seven countries that, um, Donald Trump uh, signed through executive order on uh, Friday, and that has obviously been there's been a lot of uh, you know a lot of uh, protests, a lot of uh, discussion uh, over this, and uh, at the very least, one can say that. Uh, you know, it wasn't exactly executed perfectly. There's a lot of confusion and so on. But, you know, you have to say, you had to say that uh, any any kind of executive order like this is probably going to be executed in a messy way in the first few days. So I, I don't make a big deal out of the fact that it has been executed so inefficiently. Uh, I'd rather I'd rather we talk the actual and discuss the actual, uh, the actual ban, the actual executive order, what it implies. And, I, and you know, I'm going to try because I know I, I've been accused of not being objective about Trump, of um, I've been accused of, uh, you know, not actually giving it uh, the, the, the best show. So we're going to take, we're going to take as an objective, I think I'm always objective, but as, as much of an objective, um, approach to this as, uh, whoops, this thing is, I'm sorry, the, my, uh, my microphone uh, stand is giving me a hard time. We're going to take as good of a, as much of an objective approach to this as we can. Uh, I want to read some stuff out of the ex actual executive order, um, maybe even look at the statute uh, that the executive order is relating to, is referring to. Um, but let me just say right off the bat, uh, you know, I think most of you uh, know my opinion about this, or if you don't, I, I think it's ridiculous. I think this ban is ridiculous. I think it's silly. I think it's idiotic. Uh, and I know people get pissed off when I say uh, stuff uh, from Trump is idiotic. And let, let me just say that I think the worst element of this, um, the worst element of everything related to Trump is not what Trump does. Uh, you know, Trump is doing what Trump promised he would do and Trump, you know, you know in, in, in a kind of a mixed weird fashion, but he's doing everything he promised he would do. What it really strikes me as, um, I don't know, as disturbing, if you will, is how so many people who voted for Trump, so many people who support Trump, support him no matter what. Um, immune to any counter-argument, uh, just blindly uh, accepting anything that he does. And, and I could see people saying, look, uh, and we'll get to this, uh, you know, it's, this is not an ideal ban. It's not a perfect ban. It, it should have been differently. I'm still a little skeptical about this, uh, but it, it's better than nothing. That would be okay. But people are defending this ban unequivocally, no challenges, no questions asked because Donald Trump did it and because they're so eager for somebody. Of course, the other issue is, I bet you anything that if at any time uh, Obama had instituted this ban with these specific countries and the, this specific list uh, publicly, had, you know, because the list existed in the Obama administration, but it wasn't as public as it is now, so many people who today support Trump and support what he this ban would have flipped out. This is not a good enough ban. This is too narrow. Why isn't Saudi Arabia on the list? Da, 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 da. But because Trump has done it, it, there's like no criticism, no criticism. Uh, I mean, the criticism is all from the left, but there's no criticism from the right. And it reminds me 
of what happened after 9-11 with George W. Bush. And, and it, 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 that nobody would criticize him from the right. Nobody would actually say that, uh, that George W. Bush was a wimp in the way he dealt with 9-11, except me and a few other people. Um, everybody said, well, you know, you can't criticize the president at the time of war, and he's tough, and he's doing this, and he's doing that. And everything I predicted about the consequences of George W. Bush's weakness, George W. Bush's compromises actually panned out in the end. In, in many respects, I, you know, I've said it here, I, I to a large extent predicted the rise of ISIS, the Arab Spring, the consequence of the Arab Spring, the falling apart of the Middle East, all of that was predictable. And all of it is consequence of George W. Bush's policy, but nobody wanted to criticize him. Just follow him blindly, wave the flag, and everybody's a patriot. And this is even worse now with Trump. And this is why I've always seen the Trump phenomena, not Trump, but the Trump phenomena, as a move towards authoritarianism. Not so much because Trump is an authoritarian. I mean, he is. His instincts are authoritarian. But because so many people, many, many more people than I'd, than I'd ever would have expected, are willing to follow, are willing to march in step and follow what he's done what he does so all right let's um let's let's look at the actual ban uh you know what what was actually passed um and as i said the ban actually um so here's here's some of the what i consider troubling language uh in the ban so this is reading from the actual executive order and he says in order to protect americans the united states must ensure that those admitted to this country do not bear hostile attitudes towards it. Now, if he'd stop there, I'd say, absolutely. I agree completely. Uh, there has to be a way to vet people coming into this country and make sure that they are not hostile to the country and, and certainly that they do not have uh, intent to be violent against this country. And uh, I'm all for vetting. I'm all for vetting for the possibility, probability that people will commit violent acts in the United States. And how you do that vetting, there's a whole art to that vetting. Uh, the Israelis are very good at it, uh, but there's a whole art to that vetting, which, which should be applied to some extent, probably is applied when people ask for visas in the interview process at the State Department, in the embassies, but I'm sure could be improved. And part of this ban is for 60 days so that uh, the Department of Homeland Security and other agencies present uh, Trump with a better vetting policy. And to that extent, I don't have a problem with better vetting policies. I think we need better vetting policies. But note the continuation of the se sentence. So do not bear hostile attitudes towards this and its founding principles. Now, what does that even mean? Now, I know what that means because I think I know what the founding principles mean. But I, I suspect that Donald Trump doesn't know what the founding principles mean. I certainly know that Bannon doesn't know what the founding principles mean. And uh, I'd suggest that 75 to 80% of the U.S. population at least doesn't know what the founding principles mean. Opening this up like this to an ideological screen, to the application, to the founding principles is a very dangerous thing, unless you are willing to articulate in the statement what those actual principles are right what those actual principles are so um, I think this is very dangerous that we have now entered into a place where the vetting is going to include ideological vetting with in terms of founding principles um, I you know I I think uh, most of the anybody who voted for Bernie Sanders doesn't know the founding principles and uh, um, you know, uh, and uh, and of course, uh, you know most of uh, most of people who uh, voted for for uh, Trump don't know the founding principles. All right, so uh, the United States cannot and should not admit those who do not support the Constitution, as understood by whom, or those who would place violent ideologies over American law. Agree completely. In addition. The United States should not admit those who engage in acts of bigotry. Now, in bigotry or hatred, you know, agree if it's defined properly. What is bigotry? How do you define bigotry? Now, they try. Here, they've included concretes, which I like. 
including honor killings, other forms of violence against women, or persecution of those who practice religious different from their own, have to define persecution. But yes, if you support honor killing, you shouldn't be allowed into the United States. Uh, if you support violence against women, you shouldn't be allowed uh, in the United States. That is, if you are a proponent of violence, if you're a proponent of violence, then you should not be allowed into the United States. That's fine. Um, uh, all those who would oppress Americans of any race, gender, sexual orientation. Again, uh, you know, uh, what about many Americans who would do the same? And, and you better define what oppress means. Uh, and you better be careful about that. Is, I mean, I, I am worried. I'm desperately worried. Anytime you, um, anytime you give the government power over determining ideology, Anytime you give the government power over screening ideology, because, you know, because there's no question in my mind that if most American governments, certainly or the Obama administration, some future Democratic administration, but even the Trump administration, would they allow a young Ayn Rand into the country? Would they allow me into the country? Right. So given that my ideology is not consistent with the ideology of 80 to 90 percent of Americans. Right. So what is um, what is the, uh, the what is the criteria? What is the real ideological screen? And do we want government recognizing that sometimes government will be led by people you don't like, even if you like Trump? At some point, there might be a Democrat in the, in the in the White House. Do you want to give that Democrat through law the ability to screen people who come into the city based on their ideology? I think that's very dangerous. If you screen it based on their propensity for violence, their willingness to commit violence, their hostility to the United States of America as exemplified by what they say and what they do, I'm fine with that. If they're hostile and if they want to commit violent acts in the United States, of course they shouldn't be allowed into this country. Very, very dangerous. If you start talking about founding principles, interpretations of the Constitution, and so on, right? So uh, it, is, uh, it, is pretty, uh, it is pretty amazing. Um, it is pretty amazing. And, and you know, I, I talked about the fact that these blind followers of Trump and the alt-right and all that it just blindly follow anything he says. And, and, of course, there's wonderful evidence of that on the chat. Now, many of you are not going to see the chat because you're listening afterwards. So I'm not going to delve into it too much. But, but you, see it, you see it right there, right? I'm the mouthpiece of the leftist media again. Right, because they have nothing to say about the actual content of what I say, should just accuse me of being part of the mainstream, and that's 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 typical, uh, you know, attempt to character assassinate without dealing with facts, uh, which is a alt right uh, pro uh, Trump kind of tactic, and we've got evidence of that right here, right now. All right, so what are we doing about how, how we what are we going to do about protecting America? How are we going to do that? What we're going to do is suspend the issuance of visas and other immigration benefits um, to nationals of countries of particular concern. Now, the countries of particular concern are not listed. There is a reference to a, um, a statute uh, that was passed under Obama. There was, uh, was listed countries where the security forces did not trust the information provided by those countries so they felt that they couldn't do proper vetting uh, of those countries. And, uh, and, you know, and if you look at the list, that kind of makes sense because what does the list include? It, 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 whoops, I just closed that window. Um, it includes uh, countries that have no real governments like Syria, Libya, Yemen, all countries with civil wars uh, to one extent or another. Syria, Libya, Le Lebanon, Somalia. Uh, and, uh, and, and, you know, countries like that. I had the list right in front of me a second ago, and I managed to brilliantly close the window uh, of, uh, of that particular thing. I'll, I'll get it up in a minute. Um, Iran, uh, Iran, I guess the idea is we're listing Iran because Iran is a country whose data we don't trust. So it's not an issue of there's no country, there's no government there, but we don't trust their data. Okay. So let's start with thinking about these seven countries, right? 
Um, Iran indeed is the largest sponsor uh, of terrorism that I have argued. So I'm, I'm all for Iran being on the list. As I'll say in a few minutes, I'm for doing a lot more than putting Iran on a list. I think that's a pretty pathetic attitude towards Iran. But um, what's obvious about this list, what's obvious about this list is what's missing from the list. What's missing from the list are countries that do have governments, governments that we pretend are our allies, and governments that we pretend we can rely on the data they give us. So the idea is you can't get data from uh, Yemen and from Libya and from um, Somalia. So we have to, okay, fine. But can we, and, but we, and we don't trust the data we get from Iran because Iran's a hostile country, but we can trust the data we get from Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Pakistan, Afghanistan. Egypt, countries that produce as many, if not more, terrorists than the seven, certainly countries uh, whose terrorists have killed many, many more Americans than the seven. We'll get to how many people have actually been killed uh, from people from coming from the countries uh, that we talked about, right? So, uh, you know, so Saudi Arabia... We can get the info, but <laughs> we can get the info, but can we trust it? Why should we trust it? Why should we trust it? Saudi Arabia works with us to prevent terrorism. Is that what happened before 9-11? Has Saudi Arabia changed over the last 14 years? Do they, 15 years, have they stopped uh, being the largest funder of radicalization, of radical mosques, of radical views in the world? No. They're much bigger than Iran in terms of actually funding radical movements. And ra did they not, were they not part of, um, of, of uh, starting ISIS and initiating ISIS? And, and, you know, there is no answer to this. So don't, you know, you can, you can, you can try. And, and uh, again, people, uh, you know, now I'm not saying you ban Islam, but you know, if you're going to make a list, you cannot make a list that is supposed to protect America. You cannot make a list that is supposed to take us to protect us from terrorism without listing Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and Egypt. How many Americans have been killed? How many Americans have been killed by terrorists from the seven listed countries? Question, how many terrorists have been killed from, but from terrorists, from immigrants, uh, from those seven in America, talking about terrorist acts in America, from the seven listed countries. Love to hear your answer on, on, uh, on the chat or anywhere else. How many terrorists have been killed from the seven listed? How many Americans have been killed by terrorists in the United States from the seven listed countries? Now, if you take Iran out, you might ask it even more broadly, but, but even with Iran in, because Iran has killed many Americans, but, but almost, almost never from those. Uh, yeah, so where were the San Bernardino killers from? That's a good question. You know, come on, people. Where were the San I mean, you guys all support, or many of you support the, uh, the Trump ban. So how many people, how many Americans were actually killed from terrorism in the United States, in America? right, from these seven listed countries? The, the, the answer is actually easy um, because it's a nice round number. And the answer is zero. Zero Americans have been killed in the United States of America by terrorists who came from one of those seven countries, right? San Bernardino, for example, uh, he was born here and she emigrated from, drumroll, Saudi Arabia. And you think we got all the correct information about her when she came here? Do we know what the San Bernardino guy did when he was visiting Saudi Arabia just a few years ago? No. Because do we trust the Saudi intelligence agencies when it comes to radicalization? I mean, you got to be nuts if you trust them. Okay? All right. So what is... How many people have died? How many Americans have died 
from terrorists who've come to the United States as immigrants or visitors from Saudi Arabia. 2,369. And this is from 1975. 2,369. How many from Egypt? 162. How many from the United Arab Emirates? 314. That's from 1975 to 2015. Those are the numbers, right? Now, I will get... I will get to what I think the policy should be and why I think the whole way the ban is being approached is wrong. I'm just dealing with the particulars of the ban right now. I'm not going to shy away from telling you how I think you should deal with terrorism and how I think we should deal with terrorism. Your chances of dying from a, uh, from a terrorist, from an Islamic terrorist uh, action in the United States uh, in any given year are 1 in 3.6 million. Your chances of dying from a terrorist activity from uh, somebody from one of these seven countries is something like one in 3.6 billion. Um, so even if you accept that we need a ban right now, and uh, it is a way to stop Americans from dying from terrorist activities by the people banning them, uh, by the people coming to the United States, then this is a stupid ban. That's my point. This is the wrong ban. So even if you accept that, which I don't, but I'll explain what I do accept in a minute, this ban just doesn't make any sense, right? Now, you could say, and I've seen, I've seen it said, that one of the issues is that he, the statute is limited to these seven countries. But if you read the statute, that's just not true. If you read the actual statute that, that passed under Obama, the statute allows for the expansion of the list, if you believe a particular country poses, and immigrants from a particular country pose a threat to the security of the United States, the list can be expanded. So there's no legislative, as far as I can tell, as far as I can tell, um, the list is, it can be expanded, uh, the list can be reviewed, uh, if you are willing to claim that that there's a real threat. The problem is that neither Obama no Trump, no George W. Bush, no most of our politicians are willing to say that the regime in Saudi Arabia is the second biggest sponsor of terrorism in the world after Iran and that they are, that they are part of the problem, that they are the enemy. I don't know any American politician or very few American politicians who actually are willing to say that. Right? So... This list would not have prevented uh, the the tourists from coming in uh, on 9-11 to attack the towers. It would have done nothing to prevent that. So uh, because the, the terrorists were from Saudi Arabia, from Egypt. Oh, by the way, Lebanon is not on the list. That's kind of curious. One of the 9-11 terrorists was from Lebanon. And Lebanon, of course, is the home of Hezbollah. Hezbollah is, is probably one of the most violent terrorist organizations killing Americans and other people all over the world. Um, they haven't done it in the United States other than, you know, 9-11 and others. But, but it's kind of curious that they are not on the list, that Lebanon's not on the list again. So this is my point. This list has nothing to do with securing America. There's zero evidence that this list has anything to do with securing America, that making us safer, preventing terrorist attack. This list has everything to do with appeasing Donald Trump's base. This list has everything to do with uh, fooling you, this is completely consistent with the whole modus operandi of Donald Trump and, and the new right or the alt-right or whatever you want to call it, of, of pretending, of faking, of lying, uh, that they care about the security of the United States, of doing things that represent uh, increasing security of the United States, when actually it doesn't when actually it's just trying to appease the base and trying to increase their power and has nothing to do with security. If they had at least put on Saudi Arabia and put on some of these other countries, I would have said, you know, I disagree with this particular policy, but I get it. At least they're trying to protect America from terrorism. But the list is such that that is not a credible position to even have. It's just not credible. And again, You guys will defend Donald Trump no matter what he does. As he said, as Donald Trump said, he could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody dead 
and you guys would still cheer him on and defend him. So, you know, it, 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 what is stunning, what is stunning about this and everything else about this past election is the extent to which people are willing to p- defend this president blindly, um, criticize everything Obama did, and I often agreed with, but defend Trump blindly, uh, even when he does th- things that are equivalent to what uh, Obama did before. This list could have been different. It could have been expanded. It didn't have to happen at all. Uh, the risks of delaying this, of doing a proper list, of thinking it through, of, of integrating uh, immigration policy towards uh, people from Islamic countries, to better integrating that into a whole foreign policy that deals with uh, terrorism, that deals with the Islamist threat to the West and to the United States. We could have waited. It's not like that terrorist attacks happening every day in the United States. They're very, it's very, very rare. There are very, very few of it. There's no rush. Uh, plus, the, 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 it, it, it fits into the whole attitude that Trump has about demonizing people, demonizing groups, demonizing groups that are convenient. Uh, you know, I, I am not for, I am against, just to be on the record, I'm against the United States spending money to bring I- uh, refugees into the United States. I'm against redistribution of wealth from Americans to refugees. I think that's immoral uh, uh, to do that. Right? But I'm all for the United States accepting refugees if they are vetted. You know, let's vet them. Let's be really rigorous about vetting them. But not to accept refugees who are running from authoritarianism, who are escaping totalitarianism. These are the kind of people we've always accepted in this country. These are the kind of people who tend to assimilate, to accept our values, and to embrace freedom. And this is as true of uh, most Muslim immigrants, as it is, and, and all the studies and surveys that have looked at Islamic immigration shows that in America, not in Europe, but in America, they have assimilated. I mean, we're not talking about floods of tens of millions. We're talking about relatively low levels of immigration. Now, again, I don't agree with subsidizing any immigration. And most refugees are being subsidized 100% by the U.S. government. That is a travesty. But the all against uh, refugees and uh, Muslim immigrants and so on is just hysterical and, and ridiculous. Okay, we got some phone calls. And by the way, you could call in. You can live tweet this. Um, and you could call 347-324-3075. I, I know many of you disagree with what I'm saying. So call in and, and tell me, why, why am I wrong? Why am I wrong? Um, but, you know... Call in 347-324-3075. Yeah, and press 1 when you call in so that I know you're calling in not just to listen to the show, but to actually ask a question or make a comment or participate in the discussion. All right. Uh, Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Uh, Peter. Hey, Peter. How's it going? Pretty good. Big fan. Good. Um, Thank you. So, yeah, I definitely agree with you that um, that – Saudi Arabia, that, that, that this list could have been expanded. But at the same time, I think we have to be careful about who we are letting in, especially what's going on in Europe, and especially the fact that a lot of these countries are hotbeds of jihadi violence. And a lot of these people are in, from what we know, could be uh, supporters of ISIS just uh, inf- infiltrating the refugee movement. So I think we need to be really careful about who we yeah, uh, I, who we are letting in, and I think uh, Peter, the I mean, process just needs to be a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I, I, I think we should have rigorous vetting processes for anybody coming in from the Middle East. But I think that the two, the, the two things that I would point out that are revealing about this list and why I don't buy that this has anything to do with national security is who's on the list, that is the biggest sponsor of Islamic Sunni terrorism is Saudi Arabia and they're not on the list. So how can you, how can you have build a wall, if you will, and then have huge gaps in the wall where you're inviting people to cross in? And, uh, you know, and the second issue is this is all pathetic in the context of what really needs to be done to win a war we're in. But I want to say something else about your comparison to Europe. Look, Europe has a border with the Middle East. 
It has a small sea called the Mediterranean. It has access to Turkey, access to other parts of, uh, of Central Asia. There is, you know, there, there is millions and millions and millions of Muslims could, if the Turks allowed it, uh, travel into Europe unstopped. And they indeed, to some extent, have. And they've created real problems in Europe. There's no question that there are real problems in Europe. And I've talked about Islamic integration, in, immigration into Europe as being a real problem. The United States has an Atlantic Ocean separating it from parts of the Middle East. And if you add the Mediterranean, it's halfway around the world. It's very difficult to get here. They don't have the money or the resources to traverse those distances. Very few of them make it. There is no massive immigration by Muslims into the United States. We're talking about at best, at most, thousands or low tens of thousands of Muslims coming into America in any given year. Yes, they should be vetted, and they can be vetted because they're not crossing an un, uh, you know, as illegal immigrants across the southern border. There's very little of that happening. Most of them are just flying in, and they can be vetted. Most of them have visas, and the visa process could be improved to improve the vetting. But that's not what's being proposed. But if it's true that they're coming in through Mexico, then that, that could also pose a problem. Yeah, but there are very so few coming in from Mexico because yeah. how did they get to Mexico? I mean, think about the – look at a map. Take a map out and think about the difficulty of having to cross the Atlantic Ocean and then climbing up through South America or, or, or through Mexico or whatever into America. And how many people that is that we are not being invaded by Muslim hordes. Now, you can't say that about, about Europe. They, there it's real. It's a real danger. It's right there in front of them. But it is not. It is not at the same level, anyway, near that level in the United States. And, and one of the things that Trump and the right have done is turn this into an issue which people are hysterical about and fearful about. And, and, and therefore, they're willing to do things that Americans typically wouldn't do. But it's all riling up this emotion of fear in order to get something done that isn't. There is, right now in the United States, the threat of terrorism from Islamists is relatively, is very low. The, 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 the violence and everything else associated with Islam that might be happening, that is happening in some places in Europe, is just there's very little evidence it's happening over here. Uh, and, and can be dealt with pretty easily over here because it's isolated and the number of Muslims in the United States is so small. It's just not an issue unless we make it an issue and Trump has every incentive to make it an issue because it's part of his whole campaign to to cause us to be I, I afraid so that he can come in with big solutions. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Peter. No, no, I was just going to say that I think it would have been – even more of an issue if Hillary had been elected, she probably would have increased the number. Because if you look at the data, um, uh, David French wrote this in his article about um, the amount of immigrants that have uh, that have uh, we've we've taken in over the over the years, our refugees specifically. Rather, um, it's actually not as it's actually a lot less yep. than um, in recent years. And I think Obama. And Hillary would have uh, probably increased the number. Well, they might have. So, but I mean, but remember, even under Obama, I, I had a list here. I'll see if I can find it. I had a list of the number of Muslim immigrants who came, who've come in uh, under Obama. And the numbers, the numbers absolutely are small, except for the last year, because there were a lot of Syrian refugees. And we accepted a lot of Syrian refugees. And you're right, or, or Hillary would have, would have increased that. Now, let, let me be clear. I, I keep saying this on my radio show. It's irrelevant at this point. The election is over. Trump won. It's irrelevant at this point what Hillary would have done. This is what Donald Trump is doing. Do we like it or don't we like it? Not relative what Hillary would have done. She's gone. She's irrelevant to the equation. We have to live with the Donald Trump presidency. And are we going to just accept it because Hillary would have been worse? Or are we going to criticize it when we think he's doing something bad? That's all. So I agree with you, Hillary would have been worse on this, but that's but it's irrelevant. Hillary lost. She she's not a player anymore. It's us and Trump. Do we just accept everything he does because he's better than Hillary? Or do we criticize him so that we move the goalposts to a better end? So maybe in the future we would have a president who's much better than Hillary and much better than Donald Trump. 
if we just accept Trump, this is what we're going to get. And I think it's pretty bad what we're going to get because I, I think he's awful. No, I, I agree with that. I, yep. I, I was I was only pointing out that um, I think that there was still potential for us to maybe end up like Europe. Um, no, the there's no that potential for that. Depending because on the amount of refugees. There's just no potential for that. Just on if the, you look at the, the sheer numbers, it can't add up to that. We're talking about in terms of the millions and millions of people. The, it, it, Europe is orders of magnitude in bigger trouble than we are. I mean, 13% of the French population is Muslim, and many of those are radicalized. In the United States, uh, it's, it, the number is, I can't, you know, again, is closer to 1%, uh, between 1% and 2%, and they are far, 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 far less radicalized than they are in Europe. They are much better assimilated. They have, their views are much less radical than they are in Europe. So they, there is no risk. There is no risk. And, and I'm confident in this one that, it, that the United States is, any, is, is uh, as threatened by Islam as Europe is. Uh, you know, you got to worry about Europe because I care about Europe. And there's a real threat over there. But the United States, I mean, this is just people being made to feel scared. There's nothing there. There's no there there. Not to say that they're not going to be terrorist attacks. They will be, and they are going to be, and we should do everything in our power to stop them. I'll talk in a little while about how to stop them. This is not going to do it. But, um, but it's, it's not the case, again, that we are under some threat of massive, even under Hillary, massive Muslim immigration. Hillary would have still, you know, we'd have got 20,000 Syrian uh, immigrants in, or even 100,000 Syrian immigrants in, which is bad, right? Because it's hard to vet 100,000 people. Is not anywhere near the problem they have in, um, in uh, Europe. Plus, again, we are so good, relatively speaking, at assimilation as compared to Europe. Europeans su really suck at assimilation. I mean, they're really, really bad at it. Anyway, thanks for calling, Peter. I appreciate it. Uh, we've got a bunch of other calls. And remember, where's my, there's the mouse. Uh, remember, you can, uh, you can call in at 347-324-3075. Um, uh, 347-324-3075. Press 1 if you want to actually be on the, uh, on the show. Um, because otherwise, I, I th your number appears, but I just think you're... Uh, you're listening. I don't know that you actually want to make a comment or ask a question. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show. Who's this? Hi, it's Jennifer in Michigan. Hey, Jennifer. How's it going? Good. How are you? I'm, I'm good. I'm good. In spite of being mad, I'm good. <laughs> oh, I was just wondering, um, what, why do you think our government seems so afraid of Saudi Arabia? I read somewhere that Trump has businesses there. I don't know if that has anything to do with why he left it off, but what is your thought about that? Well, I certainly think that Trump probably has, and Trump associates and people surrounding Trump, have significant business relationships with Saudi Arabia. Uh, certainly Rex Tillerson from his Exxon days has a certain affinity to Saudi Arabia. I'm sure he dealt with them a lot. But I actually think it goes deeper. It, it goes to the unwillingness of anybody, including Donald Trump. Donald Trump is all bluster. There's no egoism there. There's no rational self-interest in Donald Trump. He's conventional at the end of the day in his analysis. Um, and to identify, to identify Saudi Arabia as the enemy, one would have to ha take a number of steps. One would would have to identify the enemy as um, radical you know islamism so as islamic totalitarianism something like that and donald trump to his credit has done that then mm -hmm. one would have to understand what that is and who advocates for it now you have to make a list of all these countries now it becomes harder because now you have to be assertive now you have to actually say in spite of the fact that we've always been best friends with the Saudis, the Saudis actually are funding, you know, the biggest funders of Islamic terrorism in the world. And they, you know, funded radicalization in mosques all over the world. And every terrorist attack in the United States has originated in a mosque that's been funded by the Saudis. All that is, I think all that is factual. You'd have to have a backbone. You'd actually have to go against the entire foreign policy establishment, 
uh, the entire, you know, oil energy industry. You'd have to go against so many interests associated. You'd actually have to have a real moral backbone. And I don't believe Trump has a backbone. I, I really think he's he, He's a wimp um, in, yeah. in a sense that I think that he is, um, he doesn't seem to have real self-esteem. He's got a thin skin and he, he won't take a real stand that upsets, I don't know. Uh, you know, he, in the one hand, he's willing to upset people. Um, on the other hand, he's not. And it's really interesting to try to see the differences. But I think the fact that he has, and many people around him have business interests in Saudi Arabia, impacts that. The fact that they are perceived to be allies impacts that. You know, I think there's a lot that goes into it. But it's the generals are opposed to it because they think about what the implications are of identifying Saudi Arabia as an enemy. It means George W. Bush was wrong. His entire policy in the Middle East was wrong, which, which I, I agree with that statement, but it would take a lot of guts to say that. It means that um, we, by buying Saudi oil in a sense of being, we're not dealing with Saudi Arabia, we're funding terrorism against ourselves for all these years, which is true, but it require us actually accepting that. Um, and it would mean now that it would mean now that we would have to probably go to war with Saudi Arabia. And who's willing to do that? You know, think about think about what he's listed. When I read the actual, um, you know, the actual, uh, yeah, and I've I've lost it unfortunately. The actual list of, of of you know what the basis is for banning somebody. They had to be people who who uh, believed in honor killings, they should, be, they should not be allowed into the country. And, I mean, what Saudi male or how many Saudi males don't believe in honor killings? So are you really going to use Definitely. that test on Saudis? I mean, these are people who stone women to death for adultery. They chop people's hands off for stealing. They don't allow women to drive. So... Yeah. It's such hypocrisy, but it's worse than hypocrisy. It's so thinking and non-essential. So, I, you know, they, they are afraid. They're afraid of their own shadow. All of these people are afraid, including Donald Trump. Yeah, yeah it seems like he, he can, he'll have upset people about things that aren't very important, but something, like you said, something substantial like that, he doesn't really have the nerve to do it. Yeah, he doesn't have the nerve to do it. He doesn't have the knowledge to do it. You know, you have to have knowledge. You have to be able to examine the Middle East objectively. You have to be, think about the Middle East. Um, and I don't think he and his advisors can think in those terms. I don't think, and I also don't think they care that much. Again, so this is my view of Trump. Now, you know, people are accusing me of not being objective, but this has been my view of Trump for a year, and I hold to it because I think he's done nothing to change my mind. Um, I don't think Trump or Bannon care about the Middle East. The Middle East is a foil for them to establish their nationalist, economic nationalist agenda. And they need us to hate somebody in order for them to reduce our freedoms, which is what, they, which is what every authoritarian, whatever fascist does. Now, I'm not saying Trump's a fascist, but he's moving us in that direction. And he uses fascist techniques through and through. It's as if they've studied them. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bannon indeed has studied them. Just like we accused, uh, what's his name, uh, um, Obama, of being a devotee of Alinsky. Well, yes, and, and Trump is a devotee of, of kind of fascist techniques of ruling and of seeking power. He, we need an enemy. So you establish these Islamists as enemies, which is relatively easy to do. But you don't focus it on the real enemies because you have no incentive to really do that. You don't actually want to deal with the enemy. All you want to do is create fear, create, uh, create patriotism, a false sense of patriotism in Americans, so they follow you, right? So they follow you. And that's right. been my objective yeah. analysis of, of uh, Trump all along. And every day he does something new to convince me uh, that, uh, that I'm right, because this is an example. If you really cared about the security of the United States of America, this isn't the list you would have put together. That makes yeah, sense. he's not proving you wrong so far, is he? No, unfortunately not. I wish he was. I mean, some people think I just hate or, or I hate Trump. No, I hate what he stands for. I hate what he says. I am waiting for him to prove me wrong so I can. I would love 
to have a president someday, some way where I can say I agree with most of what he does, but it hasn't happened yet. It, it hasn't happened in my lifetime, and I doubt it's going to happen. And my job is to criticize them, whether they're on the right or on the left, and particularly when they're on the weird fringe crazy right, which I think, I think, uh, I think this administration seems to be uh, going in that direction. And I, and I hear, I, I still haven't heard, please call me if you, if you have an argument a legit, a, a real argument for why I'm wrong. I, 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 people, people just, what they do is they post that I'm wrong but, uh, on the chat and other places, but I haven't heard an argument why I'm wrong. I'm, I'm eager to hear it. Thanks for calling. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Yep. All right. Uh, let's see. We've got one other call. Again, call 347-324-3075. Eager to hear your argument. Um, everything that's happening around us, everything that's hap- that Donald Trump is doing, just proved everything is just just proving more and more uh what i have been saying uh that uh, uh over the last year and by the way the first one of the first people in the entire country to state that islamists were the enemy our real enemy and gave a actual plan of how to deal with the enemy was me in in, in before september 11th and certainly after september 11th so um, I'm not, a, a, you know, a, 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 you know, and, and Leonard was before me. Leonard Peacock was before me. But we, in objectivism, were the first ones. And we've got a plan. I published my plan. I've, it's in a book. You know, you could go read my plan. For, for It's called Winning the Unwinnable War. Go find Winning the Unwinnable War. That's AOI's plan for destroying the Islamic threat. And I'd like to see criticism of it. Call me up and tell me my plan is wrong and this is a better plan. But if this is not a better plan, then let me criticize it. And again, what, the whole modus operandi of Trump is to make us fearful, is to make us afraid, is to create enemies and take real enemies, but, you know, make them look you know, pretend that he's doing something about them, like in this case, right? You know, people are listing people from his administration that I should be positive for. I am, you know, I'm, I'm pro, I was very supportive of Betsy DeVos, uh, who's pro-education vouchers. Unfortunately, I don't think you can do much at the federal level to encourage vouchers because that's a state issue. I'm for General Mathis. I, you know, of all the generals out there, he might be the best. So I'm you know, defense secretary, he, he, he might be good if, if they let him do what he, what he needs to do. Let's see. The, the Pentagon is supposed to present a plan on how to defeat ISIS in 30 days. Let's see what that plan looks like. Again, I presented my plan. I, my plan is in writing. It's in a book, right? I've got a plan. I, I mentioned my plan all the time, and I'll talk about the plan in a few minutes. I want to see what their plan is. And will their plan mention Saudi Arabia? Will their plan mention Qatar? the number one fund of ISIS in the world, and yet we have a military base in Qatar. Well, will it mention the real enemies? I don't see it yet. I'm, I'm still waiting to see, right? Still waiting to see. But all I see from people who disagree with me is a blind loyalty, a blind loyalty to uh, Trump and everything he says, everything he says, uh, a claim against anybody who opposes him, oh, you're just from the mainstream media, as if that's an argument. That, that's all I see from, from those who, are, uh, who, are, who disagree. I'd like to see a reasoned disagreement, and uh, uh, particularly in this issue, where I'm, I'm much more of a, uh, of a strong position. And the idea that the Saudis are suddenly cooperating, uh, yeah, right. And, and, this is, and how would you know that from my intelligence services? These are the intelligence services that Trump criticized just a few weeks ago as incompetent and irrelevant. And to some extent, I agreed with him at the time because the intelligence services have in the past, in terms of big picture analysis, always gotten it wrong. They have bad analysis. They, they were the ones, the CIA was the one who told us the Soviet Union was doing great economically, right? They're the ones who, who, who didn't get 9-11, they're the ones who, to this day, don't believe Saudi Arabia is a threat. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you're you going to defend Trump no matter what, right? When he criticizes them and when he supports them, you're going to defend them. 
All right, we got another caller. Hi, you're on the Yuan Book Show, 48 area code. Who's this? Hello. Hello. You're on the Yuan Book Show. Hi, my name is Chandra. Ah, oh, there you are. Hi, Chandra. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Uh, I've been uh, I've been listening to this show for quite a long time now. So to, to start with, I'm not a Trump supporter or voter. I'm an Indian immigrant living in America on an H-1 visa. So I doubt would I ever vote for Trump if I uh, get a citizenship as well. But then on this uh, section, I've got certain views. So I would like to share them with you. Sure, go ahead. So so uh, I've got four questions, actually. I, I'll try to put them as succinct as possible. Uh, I, I agree that, you know, most of the people who attacked uh, during 9-11 were from Saudi Arabia. But uh, keeping this ban in mind, uh, is there any evidence that funding from Saudi Arabia is not being used to influence other people from the Middle Eastern countries? Okay, uh, let me answer that and then I'll let you ask the next question. Is that okay? Yeah. We'll sure. do the questions one at a time. It's easier for me. Uh, you're right. Uh, okay. There's plenty of evidence to show that Saudi money is being used to radicalize people all over the Middle East and other, in other countries, including the seven countries listed here. They support radical groups. Uh, they, support, they also fund uh, madrasas and radicalizations in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan and any Muslim country in the world where you see large mosques uh, where people are being radicalized. Um, it's, Saudi, it's almost always, if it's from a Sunni perspective, it's almost o- always Saudi money. So yes, they are helping radicalize people in many other countries. Go ahead. Okay, so now, so obviously there there is an evidence or there is a light proof that people from these countries also might have got influenced. Agree. So when they say that exactly these pe- pe- citizens from these countries have not attacked America, should we wait for 195 those 195 of such incidents before we take action? That is one. Okay, so let uh, me answer that. that I no, have. I don't think you should, yeah. but. Isn't it strange that the countries where we already know have committed terrorist acts and are left for, and there's no reason to believe anything's changed in those countries, um, why are they off the list? That's what I'm asking. So I'm not saying this seven shouldn't be on a list if, they, if you had a list, but why not Egypt? Why not United Arab Emirates? And why not Saudi Arabia? Why not Pakistan? And why not Afghanistan? Where we know they've committed terrorist activities against, the, against Americans. And there's no reason to believe they won't in the future. So I'm not saying you shouldn't include the seven. I'm just saying if you're going to have a list, why isn't it a bigger list? I'm just asking the question. Right. So my, uh, I think probably there would be a, a question to that uh, as an answer. So why can't we look at this as a vetting on the people with philosophically handicapped ideologies? Because people who believe in, uh, uh, religiously believe in supernatural and uh, uh, who's got very eccentric uh, ideological philosophies, won't they dilute America's strong philosophy of individualism if they are let into the society? No. Well, yes and no. Um, no, because if we had an, a strong individualistic philosophy in America, which I think is, I think our individualistic philosophy is, is watered down dramatically over the last 50 to 100 years, I don't, I, you know, given the last election, I don't, I don't know that Americans really have a strong individualistic philosophy because the two candidates were both <laughs> absolutely <laughs> collectivists, both of them. So they, there wasn't any, anybody close to being an individualist on the ballot. So I suspect we don't have one. But what America has always succeeded in doing is taking people who have a different philosophy and assimilating them and assimilating them to our philosophy. And if you, look at, if you look at even people from Muslim countries and you look at research that looks at their views when they come into the country and their views 10 years later and the views of their children, there's massive evidence that that assimilation continues, not as well as it should because we as Americans don't have the right ideas, but continues at a pretty good pace even among Muslim immigrants. So I don't fear that. What I, what I do think, and I agree with you on this, we should be vetting those who have violent tendencies. It, you know, certainly if they hold, uh, if they hold that uh, Sharia should be imposed uh, through violence, that, that it's okay to kill women because, if, you know, if they're, if they're 
for whatever reason, that murder is okay, uh, any of those things, uh, honor killings, any of those things, or if they support ISIS or support Al-Qaeda in any way, they should not be accepted into the United States. I completely agree that vetting Muslims for, uh, for ideas that are violent should be part of it. But once you start vetting for philosophies that are inconsistent with the American philosophy, that is a power I do not want to give government. Now, if they promised me that the only people doing the vetting were people who understood American philosophy as well as you do, then yeah, okay, but we know that's not the case and we know that will never be the case. So I don't want to give, I, I want to shrink government's power. I want to shrink government's control over my life, not expand it. And that would be a massive expansion of government power. Right, but but I also doubt if America really uh, blends in individualistic uh, philosophy into people who come in because we have got J.P. Morgan's and other people who were born in, you know, maybe they, for most part they were in America, still supported Adolf Hitler and Nazism. So I don't think America as a country would inculcate individualism into everybody who comes into Well, not everybody, land. but that was the point and I was making earlier. Americans don't have the individualism tendency anymore. People who are born here don't have it because our educational system doesn't teach it. So it's not immigrants that are the problem. It's us. It's our immigration. It's our education system. It's our political system. It's our ideology. It's our intellectuals. That's the problem today. Immigrants are footnotes to that problem. Right. Right. And and, and the final closing question. Yeah. Uh, so my, my doubt is, like, should USA, USA be a charitable home for all the naked savages around the world? Because is it not economic cannibalism to try to stomach these people, even though our own people are not well off yeah. financially right now? Well, no, but it doesn't have to be, right? Immigrants are not. It's not a zero-sum. Immigration is not a zero-sum. So start with the fact that real savages can't come to the United States because they're poor, too poor to actually get here. We shouldn't subsidize them. And absolutely, we shouldn't provide them with welfare. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't provide them with anything like that. But if people want to come here to work, then that work is not a zero sum. Work is an additive. So work adds value. It adds wealth. It, it adds prosperity to everybody else around us. So I have no but, problem with people coming here if I they're see, willing to work. But I seriously doubt any of these people would land in America if they are asked to work instead of taking yeah, but that's, the handout. That's given just by factually the not true because the United States, uh, most of these people do work. 90% of them work. Very few of them land up on welfare relative. In Europe, you're right. In Europe, it's a real problem because as soon as they get, as soon as they cross the border into Europe, they're handed a check and they're giving housing. But in spite of the, how bad our welfare state is, we are nowhere near as bad as Europe, and it's still true that most Mexicans who come here, but even most Muslims who come here, actually work at the end of the day. I mean, so, yes, some of them go on welfare, but that's a small minority of them. Now, sure, let's fight the welfare state. Let's reduce welfare. Let's eliminate welfare, right? I'm all for that. But let's, again, right. not mix the problems. The problem of welfare is not the problem of immigration. It, let's, let's only admit people into the country who are committed to finding a job. Let's advocate for that. I'm all for that. But that's not what these restrictions are about. That's not what Donald Trump is about. He never said that. He just said, we don't want Mexicans or we don't want, uh, you know, most illegals who come into the country work because they can't get welfare as illegals and they work. They, and, and one of the reasons they come here is because they want to work. And they pay taxes because right. they work right. and, they, and their taxes are deducted from their work. Anyway. All right. Thanks for being a listener. Okay. Uh, thanks for sure, listening. Sure. Thanks, Sharon. Appreciate it. All right. We got, we got lots of callers today. That's good. Hi, you're on the Iran Book Show. Who's this? Uh, hi, this is Eric from New Hampshire. Hi, Eric. How are you? I'm doing good. Yeah, I just wanted to mention uh, uh, something uh, related to this, which is uh, around 2000, I think, 9 or 10, I was teaching English in Iwu, China. Okay. And uh, at that time, uh, one of my students was an Iraqi, and uh, he was a businessman, you know, buying products uh, from, from uh, China, selling them in, in Iraq. <clears throat> and uh, I guess he made a lot of money doing that. And uh, um, he expressed to me his yep. interest in visiting the U.S. Yeah. 
and uh, you know I, I helped him doing uh, I helped him doing that, <clears throat> and uh, he he seemed to be a good guy. He was very nice, very yeah, friendly. Yeah, yeah. Um, I like I like talking with him a lot. Uh, you know, nicer than many Americans I've met. <laughs> sure. So what, where are you going with this? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, well, with this ban. Yeah, if would exclude him. Be able to come yeah. to America. Let me let me give you an even more egregious egregious example. Um, part of, some of the people who were held up at the airport last night, uh, they've been released uh, partially because of a judge's order, uh, and partially because the ban that that uh, Trump signed has uh, has the ability to the, the officials have ability to exclude individuals. But some of the people stopped at the border were were, were people who had helped American troops, translators and others who had helped American troops in, um, in, in Iraq during, during the war. These are clearly American allies. These are people who wanted to help America. They were anti the terrorists, and they helped the American forces to defeat the terrorists. Um, there is a, now, the ban has not been implemented towards Afghanistan, but there's a good example of a woman. If the ban was expanded to Afghanistan, there's a woman who was the first Afghan fighter pilot, first pilot and, and fighter pilot in the Afghan uh, Air Force, right? And she's a woman, and she's constantly under death threats in Afghanistan. And she's, she believes in women's, uh, you know, uh, in, in equality, and she loves America, and, and she's a secularist. And she is just, uh, and she was in America for training, and she asked for political asylum so she wouldn't have to go back to Afghanistan because of all the death threats she gets there from not just the Taliban, but people affiliated with the government over there because it's so anti-women and anti-Western. So are we going to grant her? She's a hero. Shouldn't we grant her asylum? Will this administration grant her asylum? If the ban was expanded, would they? So I agree with you. I mean, a, a blanket ban on people from these countries um, is, is a huge mistake. Uh, they're good people. They're bad people. Let's really mm -hmm. vet them and let's figure out uh, who mm -hmm. they are. So, Eric, thanks for calling. Really appreciate it. It's always good to hear from you. Um, I'm going to take one more call in a minute. Uh, on the chat, somebody's saying, look, you're on. And I hear this all the time. Immigrants all vote Democratic. Um, well, two things. One is immigrants only can vote after they become citizens. And that's a pretty lengthy process. Um, and I'm all for, by the way, and have said so on many occasions, making it very difficult to become citizens. When it comes to citizenship, I think you should know a lot about the American Constitution. I think you should know a lot about the American founding principles of this country. I think there's a lot more that should be done with regard to citizenship. Uh, visiting here, having a visa to come to this country is not the same as citizenship. Uh, having the ability to work in this country is not the same as citizenship. I believe strongly it should be easy to come to this country to work and it should be hard to become a citizen of this country. Okay. But above and beyond that, just the empirics. Yes, all immigrant groups going back a hundred years tend to initially vote overwhelmingly democratic. And then with each generation post that, that seems to diminish. And it's, there's plenty of evidence, strong evidence, that this is also true of, for example, Hispanic immigrants, Muslim immigrants, other immigrants, that they become less and less uh, Demo Democratic, more and more Republican. But there's also an assumption here, which I think is wrong, and that is that the Democrats are the bad guys and the Republicans are the good guys. I don't buy that. I know many of you think that's unequivocal. I think Democrats and Republicans are bad guys. Right? I think it, the whole political spectrum is bad guys. I think collectivism is evil and bad. And, and certain elements within the Republican Party are worse than the Democratic Party. So I don't buy this. It's, we're on the right with the Republicans. I'm not on the right with the Republicans. Not. This is why I'm so critical of Trump and everybody else. Right, And I was critical of Bush because I take them. I take principle by principle, issue by issue, and guiding principle by guiding principle. That's what interests me, is where are they leading this country to? And both Democrats and Republicans are leading this country into an abyss. Into an abyss. And in some senses, Democrats will make it faster. In other senses, Republicans are going to make it faster. And the fact that a Republican, a tough guy like Trump, 
does a band that's pathetic like this is 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 not a good thing. Not a good thing. All right. It, to the extent that Republicans are pro-immigration, but they're not anymore, right? Which is which is uh, uh, unbelievably sad. Unbelievably. All right. We got one more caller. Uh, Five oh four area code. Hi, you're on the Yaron Brook Show. Hey, Yaron. This is Nick. Uh, hey, Nick. First of all, you did, you did a great, much better job on Gavin McInnes' show, by the way. I'm sorry he rudely cut you off at the end, but I think that was a joke. I hope you got it. But uh, anyway, I'm calling. What, what do you mean I did a better job? Attack. Better job is compared to what? Compared to today, because you're not being objective again, uh, attacking the Trump uh, fans, which I am one. Yep. I'm not 100 uh, percent Trump fan. I'm against the ban. Not uh, as bad as you are. I think it's impractical. And you I'm think Kevin McGinnis uh, cut uh, me off as a butt. joke? So, so cutting people off is a yeah, joke? Yeah, yeah. His, Really? Well, his, it was a joke in the sense that you're too smart for him, and uh, he couldn't answer your question, so he that's uh, right. jokingly made a face. And well, but that's that not a joke. Time, so. That's uh, admitting sorry. that yeah, he's not smart enough to handle my questions. <laughs> well, but he wasn't trying to hide. I'm, that's the way he is with everybody. Don't, don't take it personally. I don't take anyway, any of this personally. Um, want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Anyway, but I wanted to uh, – but you did, a, you did do a great job that day, so um, – but today, uh, the main thing is I, I make points all the time on Trump, and none of them get answered. Uh, so I, I don't know why. You so know, go ahead. Make the, the points. Objective is the Here's your opportunity. Well, make the points. The, okay. One at a time My so main, I can answer them because I can't do more than one at a time. One at a, one at a time. All right. The main point about today, even though I'm against this as a practical, I, I think uh, the attacks on him are wrong. First of all, we're in the middle of this. He said this is a stopgap measure. He's trying to stop the bleeding. Uh, the first thing I would do is if I see – if I'm an objective can I person, Can I answer I that? This, I wouldn't immediately – hold on, but, but I have, yeah, the ahead. thought's not complete. I'll, I'll let you answer. It's real, real quick. I would say look at the list and go, well, this list is incomplete, and they're leaving off the, the number one terrorist countries. Why is that? And I would not run to the microphone or blog or whatever and start – well, see, he must have businesses there. And this, I'd first ask the, ask so, the administration. So you, did you listen to the show maybe, today? On, one last point. One last point. Yep. Maybe, yeah, I did. Listen yeah, when did when did when did when did, when did Trump businesses? I'll let you make the last point. Let me just answer this point. When did okay. Trump's business okay. uh, uh, business connections come up? How far into the show did that no, happen? Not, no, 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 no. Not, not. I didn't mean that you did. I'm sorry. Okay. I, well, I, let, I, let's. But let's let's things. finish this. Uh, as an objectivist, how did well, I start the show off early. today, a- attacking Trump? Did I say the list is is incomplete? Yes. Did I give evidence that the list is incomplete? Yes. Go ahead. Well, but you don't know why he left them off the list. For instance, maybe he's talking in the back. Maybe, for instance, uh, this is just hypothesis yep. because we don't. It's not done yet. Yep. But uh, maybe he's talking to some countries and they're willing to do things on their own, so he doesn't have to. Put so did I address that, that question? That did I address that question oh, uh, over the last hour and ten Go minutes? Ahead. Yes, maybe I did. I, that then. Go ahead. I did. I addressed that right. question by saying that I wouldn't trust a word that the Saudi Arabians told me that the history with our relations with Saudi Arabia is such that nobody should trust a word that they All tell right. us. So I, now so I might be wrong. Deal. Let's Maybe let's get this right. Wait, 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 wait. Let me finish. I might be wrong. It could be that Donald Trump is doing stuff in the background that would that, that in a few weeks I will say, wow, that's amazing. I was wrong. But you know what? I have to judge everything based on all the evidence in front of me. And the evidence right now, the evidence of Donald Trump, the evidence of the people surrounding him, everything I have said today is based on all the evidence we have now. The difference between you and so many, me and so many of you guys is I'm not willing to give him an inch when it comes to credit because I don't think he deserves it. So I don't believe he's doing something good in the background well, I, now that, now he I might be right. Past, he might though, be, but I don't believe it. And you wouldn't have done that if it was Obama. You would have not, never given him an inch in the background. Maybe he's doing something good at the beginning of his administration. So I don't. Th- I I think I've been incredibly objective today, and uh, and I didn't rush to say he's got business interest. I think he does, and I've said that in the past. But I didn't blame this on that. I actually said. I think this is a pattern among all of our establishment who refused to take on the Saudis. Bush refused it, and almost every Republican out there has refused it, and Trump is continuing the same wimpy path. Now, if he proves me wrong, you'll call up and you'll tell me, you're on, you were wrong. But you can't do that yet. 
Go ahead. Well, I mean, you, but you're basing it. You're saying you're saying the past. You're saying I'm not giving him an inch because of the past. But I'm saying your 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 uh, description of the past, your idea of what the past is, is wrong. I, I disagree with you. You're saying he's a bad person because of the past. Therefore, I'm not giving him an That's inch. That's fine. So we disagree well, on that. Well, this is just Let's a, accept uh, the fact that my evaluation of Donald yeah. Trump as a human being and as a president is different than yours. But given that that evaluation, did I treat this issue objectively or did I just run off and attack him uh, irrationally? And, and I think I what? treated this, given that, based on my evaluation of, of since he started running for president, of everything he's done, I have a very, very, very low evaluation, all based on facts, by the way, which you disagree with. That's fine. But given that, this is my evaluation of what he's done. You know, you, you want me to, to pretend that I don't think that he is a, a everything I think about him and just pretend that this is a blank slate. I mean, that 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 is irrational, unobjective and would be wrong of me to do. If there's evidence to suggest that I'm wrong about Donald Trump, you know, I want the facts. And when he when he goes after Saudi Arabia strong and really stands up for it, you will call up and say, you're on. Here's a fact. Here's where you are wrong about Donald Trump. I have yet to see facts like that. When they happen, you know, I'll acknowledge my failures. Well, you don't think that Islam, by its essence, is an objective threat to America, and it'd be like stopping Nazis from coming into a, a no. I don't. When we're at war, I don't. And I've said that well, yeah, for years. I, I I don't think being Muslim makes because you a, a threat to the United States. I think there is a difference between being a Muslim and being a Muslim committed to violence. And if you're a Muslim committed to violence, then you are an objective threat to the United States. Uh, and, and if you're just if, if you're uh, an, what I call an everyday Muslim, I don't think you're a, a threat to the United States. And let me say again, for the sake of objectivity, I know something about Islam. I've lived with Muslims. I know Muslims in ways that most of you don't and, and have never had have ne haven't studied it anywhere near as much as I've studied it and have not interacted with Muslims anywhere near the amount I've interacted with them. So. And I've, I've been threatened by them. I've had guns pointed at me. I know what that's like. And I can separate because I'm an individualist. I look at individuals and I look at ideas. I, I believe ideas shape. And there's a difference. There's a fundamental difference between what I consider everyday Muslims and between Muslims who are willing to use violence in the name of their religion. And, you know, the one I would ban, I would unbelievably ban. I would do much more than Trump will ever do. I mean, I... I haven't gotten to this, and, and now's the time I'll, I'll spend the last 15 minutes, uh, if you'll, uh, the last 15 minutes, of telling people what I would do to deal with the Islamic threat, and then measure me versus Trump, right? Let me say what I would do about the threat, and then measure that against what Trump is going to do over the next four years. And you tell me who is more cognizant of the threat and who's willing to do more in order to defend Americans. I am much more America first than Trump is ever going to be. Can I give you one criticism of that before you go into sure. the uh, description of what you would do? Sure. Just so you can put, maybe you can integrate it in your... Sure. So uh, I, Islam, I agree, most of them are peaceful, but I think they are like church on Sunday Christians. They are, they are cheating on their religion. And one other thing I have about that... Of course they're cheating on their religion. They, uh, but 90, let, me just, let me just address that. 99% okay. of Christians are cheating on their religions. And so are most Jews cheating right, on their Christians religions. I agree with all war. of that. I don't but disagree with that. Christianity is not waging war on us. I, well, but neither are the more, uh, neither are the ones who are, are cheating on their religion. If you're cheating on your religion, but then you're not waging war against me. What I, what the people the who are waging war is. against me are the consistent Muslims. Fine, let's go after them. But but one more point on the the cheating uh, Muslims. My my words, not yeah. yours. Uh, that uh, they they are not only not cheating, but I think I don't see the Muslim, the peaceful Muslim community freaking out. I mean, I would be. Apoplectic. If uh, if a group that I had belonged to was committing these violent acts, I would be organizing, or you know, organizations and protesting and stop uh, uh, besmirching our name. I don't see this. I I see uh, some words. I see some organizations. I I, should, I, should I don't see disagree a with you. Times more than what you see. I don't disagree with you, and <laughs> and that's that's why uh, my vetting my vetting of people coming into this country from Muslim countries would be really uh, uh, stringent. And 
I agree with you about many Muslims here, particularly many of like uh, organizations like CARE in the United States. They are part of the enemy, and I would be a lot tougher on them. I don't see that here. I mean, I'm waiting to see where there is real toughness against the real enemy. I want to see the enemy defined and really gone after. This is not it. Se these seven countries, you know, and now you might be right. In a month, he might come out with something new, and I, you will call me and say, Yvonne, you were wrong. See, he just needed time, and he was heading in that direction. My estimation is he doesn't know what that direction is, and that's just my estimation, right? That's my, based on everything I know about the world, that's my view. But I don't disagree with you about the state of Islam in the world. I don't disagree with you fundamentally about uh, who the enemy is, and we should really be watching these people. I said right after 9-11, we should be, and I've said it often about the NSA, the NSA should have every Muslim in America's phone basically tapped. They just shouldn't be listening to me, but they should be listening to Muslims because, the, because that's where the possible threat is. So don't, you know, don't listen to everybody. Listen to do profiling. I'm all for profiling. I've always been for profiling. So, look, you're not going to outflank me in terms of defending America and understanding Islam. All right, we're running out of time, and I do want to say what I would do, right? And I started right there. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for, for calling. Call. And look, guys, thank you. you know, call me and challenge me. You know, I, I, <laughs> I just think uh, many of you are, are, are wrong. All right, here's, here's the thing, guys. I believe with war. I believe we really at war. And it's not, it, it, this is not a hypothetical. I think 9-11 was a declaration of war, but I think the real war, as again, I've said many times, the real war started uh, in, uh, on November 4th, 1979, a date that, that should go down in infamy because it was the date that the Iranians took over the American embassy in Tehran. And that, I think, was the beginning of a war against the United States by the Islamists. Islamists of Shiite and Sunni, it doesn't matter. But these are Islamists, right? And they're attacking us. And they want us to kill, to kill us. Now, they're not very successful. They haven't killed a lot of Americans. The chances of you dying of a terrorist attack are minuscule, minuscule. And that's not going to change. But that, why should we have any chance of dying in a terrorist attack? Why shouldn't we drive those probabilities to zero? Because they are... Uh, child molesters out there, but your child has a very low probability of being molested, you don't say, well, let's not go after the molesters. No, that's not an argument, right? So you got to crush this enemy. So I believe, and have said this since 9-12-2001, that we should declare war on Islamic totalitarianism. We should identify the main, the countries that are supporting, funding, arming, and ideologically sponsoring these ideas. I think they're primarily two countries, Saudi Arabia and Iran. We should identify the organizations, the terrorist organizations, and the intellectual organizations that fund, support, and are actively engaged in terrorist activities and planning against the United States, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Muslim Brotherhood. And then I would take those countries and take those organizations and I would crush them. I would make it so painful so that nobody ever thought that, is, that, 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 that the Islamists had any chance of winning, that the Islamists have any chance of succeeding. I would take the, the, the whole element of Allah is on your side, I would destroy that so that they would never think that Allah is on their side and they would have to question, really, really question what they are doing why they are being crushed why they are being humiliated i would humiliate them militarily and i would call out their ideology for the barbarism that it is and i would cause them to question that ideology this is what we did the japanese after world war ii and this is what needs to be done in the middle east and until we do that in the middle east until we do that in the middle east then we will not be successful. You can't not build, and I didn't get to building a wall. You cannot build walls and defend yourself. What you need to do is go to where they live and make it clear to them that they should never, ever, ever, ever mess with Americans because they 
will die if they do. And they will suffer if they do. And their families and loved ones will suffer if they do. That's how you end wars. That's how we've always ended wars throughout history. Wars don't end unless you do that. It's not pleasant. It's not nice. It's not even nice to talk about it. Who wants to talk about killing people and, and people suffering? But that's what needs to be done now. So I would declare war. Now, once you declare war, in the context of war, now you could have the NSA listening to phone calls and reading emails and doing like that for the period of the war. Now you can ban immigrants from all Muslim countries or have you know big vetting processes and everything because it's war. During World War II, we did not let Nazis in. During World War II, we did not let the Japanese didn't immigrate into America. And during a war, you can listen into all their conversations, even if they are American citizens. So I can't, I can't tell you, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to declare the enemy and declare war on the enemy. And this cannot be done by the president. This is the job of Congress. This is the division of powers. Congress is the agency that declares war. So Congress needs to declare war and give the president the tools necessary to win that war. That war, in my view, is easy to win. If you actually destroy the, the, the two centers, Saudi Arabia and Iran, I mean, eliminate those regimes, then you will destroy the will to fight for the radicals. If you make it clear to them that they and everybody around them will suffer, they will stop. Now, people say, how is bombing Saudi Arabia going to stop uh, you know, terrorist attacks in San Bernardino? The only reason San Bernardino happens is because they believe they will be successful, because ISIS gains territory, because there seems to be, there seems to be a, um, what do you call it? Uh, there seems to be a caliphate being forming. And now I can go to heaven fighting for a winning cause. Nobody commits suicide for a losing cause. Nobody fights for a losing cause long term. There's a, you know, there's a really good book on terrorism that was written by Netanyahu, you know, when he, when he actually was thinking straight about terrorism, what motivates them and how, they, how, how to deal with it. And you got to crush their spirit. You got to make it clear that they're on the losing side. You got to make it clear that a caliphate will never, ever happen. You got to make it clear that Allah is not on their side. Now, somebody's asking me here why I don't testify. Don't testify where? I don't understand. I don't understand what you mean by, um, right? Now, why didn't I start with that? I didn't start with that because, I, you know, I've been saying this for years and years and years. Most of you know this. This is not new. I've said it on this show many, many times. Read. Read. Nothing less than victory by John. Uh, 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 oh, my God. Read, just look up, nothing less than victory. Um, read, winning the unwinnable war. I mean, read, you know, everybody has an opinion. Everybody out there has an opinion. Everybody has an opinion about what I think. But John Lewis, you know, I'm embarrassed unbelievably to say that Lewis dropped from my, ah, that's horrible. I'm getting old. Uh, John David Lewis, um, let's watch. On YouTube, you can go watch America versus Americans, uh, Don, uh, Leonard Peikoff's excellent uh, uh, you know, speech. If you're interested in these issues, if you're interested in these issues, then read about them before you, you, you develop a passionate opinion. If you, wanna, if, if you think you know what I stand for, then you know, investigate a little bit. All right. Anyway. That's my view on how to win a war. And that's a view I've been articulating for over 15 years. And, uh, and Donald Trump and George W. Bush and the Republicans and all these people are wimps, but they're not just wimps. It's not an issue of cowardice. It's an issue of ignorance. It's an issue of ignorance of what America is about. It's an issue of ignorance of what America first, properly understood as defending the individual rights of Americans first, stands for. What these people are are nationalists, are collectivists, 
And nothing good, nothing good will come from nationalism and collectivism. You can't say, well, you know, we need to tolerate collectivism in order to achieve this good over here. So individualism, fighting for individual rights is what we're about. And a ban on these seven countries and the way it's done is a clear violation of individual rights. Do you know that the stopping at the border people have green cards? On what basis? Because they happen to have a passport from Yemen? They've already been vetted. They're already, you know, permanent residents of the United States. This is, this is rule of law. This is individual rights. But no, from a collectivistic perspective, they come from Yemen. Right? You want to investigate them, investigate them in the United States. They're basically residents of the United States. You can't just out of nowhere say no more green can holders from these countries would be admitted. So, ah. okay, well, we spent a lot of time today on phone calls. Uh, so, but that's good because I want you guys to participate and I want you guys to ask questions. I still am not getting enough phone calls from you people who claim you violently disagree with me. I'd like, you know, I want the challenge. Come up and give me a call and, 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 and actually talk about what it is you think I'm wrong about. I want, I want facts. I want evidence. What is my, where is my estimation of Donald Trump wrong? What have I said that Donald Trump would do or I think of Donald Trump that has been wrong? Man up, people. Come on. Don't just put stuff on the chat and run away. And, and I can't really follow the chat because I'm trying to run a show. So I see half sentences. Call in. Let's see you. Okay, maybe, maybe next time, right? All right, so keep an eye on this. Now, I'm glad the Fed, this Fed, these federal judges uh, have ruled uh, certain aspects of, of this, uh, at least have stayed some of this stuff because I think there's enormous injustices going on at our airports. Uh, but as I said, I think the fundamental is you got to define the enemy. You got to declare war on the enemy. You got to destroy the enemy in the process. Ban the ban the enemy at the same time, right? Ban the enemy at the same time. All right. Um, we'll have to leave discussion of the wall to another time. And I was going to talk about private uh, public partnerships, and I will do that as well for another time. Obviously, I'm against the wall, and obviously, I'm against public private partnerships. We will. Uh, uh, but but we'll do that in the future, and 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 I really want to get into more philosophical content. Although I hope that you see w how this is philosophical, right? When you think about individualism, when you think about the role of government as protecting individual rights, when you think about that as the purpose of government, is an American government is supposed to protect the individual rights of Americans? Then it's much sharper as to what needs to be done in order to protect those rights. Then that is the entire focus. And all this nonsense about, you know, which Muslims, which are not, now you've got a criteria. Who's the enemy, who is not, now you've got a criteria. And criteria like what kind of economic relationships we have with these countries, whether we buy oil from them or not. All of this other stuff is irrelevant. And how they vote is irrelevant. That's not the job of government. The job of government is not to have ideas. I want a government that has no ideas, ideology. All it does is protect our individual rights. It doesn't have a, uh, a uh, what do you call it, an ideological screen because the government has no ideology. It's there to protect rights, period. All right. Um, have a good week, everybody. I will see you same time. Well, next week, also on Sunday. Uh, it will be again on Sunday from 11.30 a.m. Um, you can also catch, I talked about on the AM560 show, I had a bunch of other callers and, and talked about basically the same issue. If, you're, if you're, you haven't had enough of this issue, of the, the, uh, uh, then you can uh, catch it on uh, AM560, which will be uploaded either tomorrow or Tuesday. You can also get all of this stuff on Facebook Live, and I will talk to you all really soon. Have a great weekend.